I hereby open this academic session in which Bilal, Shikur, and Dries will defend his academic thesis entitled Epidemiology of Anemia Among Children in Ethiopia, Trends, Inequalities, Determinants, and Implementation. May I ask you to, to present uh, the results of your thesis? Thank you very much. Uh, dear uh, Pro-Rector, Defense Committee advisors and invited guests, I thank you very much for coming. I will be presenting the short summary of epidemiology of anemia among children in Ethiopia, trends, inequalities, determinants, and implementation. Ethiopia is the second most populous country in Africa. It's located in the eastern part of Africa known as Horn of Africa. Uh, it is a country of diversity with more than 80 languages, elevating, elevation ranging from minus 125 meters as high as 4,550 meters. The country is a federal, the federal state with 11 regions and two city administrations. Anemia is defined as a condition in which the hemoglobin concentration or the number of red blood cells is lower than normal for specific age and sex. Progress in the reduction and prevention of anemia has been unsatisfactory globally. The worldwide prevalence of anemia decreased from 27% in 1990 to 23% in 2019, just 4% reduction in the past 20 years. However, also the total number of anemia has increased from 1.4 billion in 1990 to 1.7 billion in 2019. Evidence on the etiology of anemia in Ethiopia is scarce, and uh, the total prevalence of anemia has increased from 2005, which was 54%, and uh, to 53% in 2016, with no sign of improvement in more than a year, in more than 11 years. In Ethiopia, the etiology is controversial. Whether there is adequate dietary intake of iron or not is yet debatable. Etiology of anemia is multifactorial and varies across contexts. This figure shows the conceptual framework of the etiology of anemia. As the framework indicates, the fundamental determinants of anemia, such as geography and politics, determine or contribute to the underlying determinants of anemia, such as education and wealth. These underlying determinants in turn contribute to the immediate determinants of the intermediate determinant of anemia, such as food insecurity, poor access to health care, poor access to water, sanitation, and hygiene. The intermediate determinant finally lead to the very known immediate determinants, including nutritional deficiency, uh, hemoglobin disorders, and exposure to infection, disease, and inflammation, finally causing anemia. Uh, in this thesis, we have used special approach, especially for paper two and paper three. It is an approach that accounts for physical location, position of the event in the area. The null hypothesis of special, uh, special approach says there is no clustering exists. Diseases occur randomly across geography. However, the term clustering describes the aggregation of disease events over a, ge a geographic area. And this special approach uses maps for visualization of high-risk geographies or areas. We've also used the demographic and health survey of Ethiopia. And as you know, demographic health survey is the largest and the longest survey globally. It has been there for more than 30 years in, and it conducted more than 320 surveys so far, operating in more than 19 countries. Ethiopia has been one. It is a nationally representative data, and it focuses on population, health, and nutrition, also GPS data. Ethiopia has so far conducted four rounds of national Ethiopian demographic survey in 2000, 2005, 2011, and 2016. This is the picture of the cover bit of the 2016 Ethiopian demographic health and survey. So our paper one is about the trends of anemia among young children aged 6 to 23 months in Ethiopia from 2005 to 2016. 
So the, briefly, the methodology is we used the three rounds of EDH SASA where hemoglobin is available, 2011 and 16, and we included the total 7,324 children aged 6 to 23 months old. HemoQ testing was done for these children, and children were assigned as anemia if the hemoglobin level is less than 11 gram per deciliter. We did also a concentration index to quantify the degree of inequality between the poor and the rich uh, against the anemia. This concentration index value ranges between minus one and plus one, the negative value indicating anemia disproportionately affecting the poor. The positive value on the other hand describes that anemia disproportionately affect the rich. The, the further the concentration index from the zero, the higher the inequality exists. So the most important finding on the first paper were, one, anemia is persistently high throughout the study period. It was 71% in 2005, and it's still 72% after 11 years in 2016. So there is no sign of reduction of anemia in this age group. And the concentration index revealed there is a world-based inequality, meaning higher concentration of anemia among children occurs in the poorest group. This disproportionately high frequency of anemia among the poor household will be due to a variety of factors. For example, higher income households consume more iron-rich food such as meat, and another factor would be the lowest quantities of socioeconomic status have lesser coverage for maternal and child health services. This is the risk factors of anemia across child age. So across the EDHS data from 2005 to 2060, the younger the age, the higher also of anemia. For instance, in 2005, children from six to 11 months were 1.7 or seven times higher also of anemia compared to children from 12 to 23 months. The same is true for 2011 EDHS data. And in 2016 EDHS, children between six to 11 months of old had 1.5 times higher also of anemia compared to the children from 12 to 23 months. So the message here is that anemia affected more younger children than older children. As we know, this is the period of fastest growth with increased nutrient intake, and it is a time for complementary feeding and uh, contamination. So some key nutritional determinants of anemia are lack of dietary diversity, lack of iron-rich food in, this, in the introduction period, and starting of cow's milk, which could lead to anemia more in this age group. The other risk factors that we found across this groups were living in pastoralist context, in pastoralist setting of Ethiopia. Ethiopia has agrarian setting and pastoralist setting. So those children living in pastoralist setting had 1.8 times higher rates of anemia in 2011 compared to the agrarian one, agrarian one and 1.5 times higher rates of having anemia uh, in 2016 compared to uh, that of the agrarian children. Then the second paper is about the special inequality of anemia among children in Ethiopia using the 2016 EDHS data. The data for this EDHS 2016, we have also used the GBS data of the same year. We included a total of 9,268 children, aged 6 to 59 months. We use HemoQ testing for anemia assessment and other important uh, geospatial and statistical methods were also applied. As we can see from the picture uh, of this geospatial analysis, the local moral eye test and both the case of this and local moral test, high clustering of anemia in the eastern part of the Ethiopia. So the red dot points indicate that there is high clustering. There are hotspots of clustering of anemia, particularly found on the eastern part of Ethiopia, like Somali, Afar, more of the pastoralist area and also uh, some in the south, in the western part of Ethiopia. We have also, you know, confirmed this finding using another methodology like SATSCAN statistics among the same age groups, and we found high clustering of anemia in the bigger circle uh, in the eastern part of Ethiopia. And there are also within region clusters in some regions of Ethiopia, like uh, 
in, in Oromia, Southern Nation, Nationality of People, Ethiopia, Ben Shangul Kumuz, and the Gambella. So both of this methodology confirmed that anemia clusters in some area of Ethiopia, though it is still prevalent in other parts of Ethiopia. Then we move to the paper three, which is about the risk factors of anemia among preschool children in Ethiopia, a Bayesian geostatical model. After we know that anemia is geographically clustered in the, our paper two, we did further analysis to identify risk factors accounting for this geospatial variation with the same number of children and using the same methodology with paper two. And what we found is that poverty is associated with anemia. The poor the family is, then the higher likelihood of the child to have anemia compared to the richer the family. This graph shows uh, the decreasing trend in, 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 in anemia when the wealth status goes up. In addition to poverty, other risk factors include and being having anemic mother is uh, associated 1.6 times higher also having children with anemia compared to with children with no maternal anemia. So maternal anemia is a risk factor for uh, childhood anemia. And the other one is child malnutrition. For example, child wasting is uh, one of the important factors that we identified to determine uh, childhood uh, anemia. Children with wasted children have 1.35 times higher also having anemia compared to non-wasted ones. This, we then move to paper four, which assesses iron deficiency anemia in it and inadequate in dietary intake of iron among children in the Eastern pastoralist part of Ethiopia. We choose this place because it is one of the hot areas we identified in the geospatial analysis. This picture shows you the typical district of uh, uh, the Eastern part of Ethiopia called Somali region, Kabri Bayya district. So you can see the livelihood, the camels and the housing of the pastoralist community looks like this. In this study, we applied multiple 24 hour recall approach to assess the dietary intake of iron. And we applied National Cancer Institute methods to, uh, to determine, to model the usual intake of iron. As you know, most of the dietary intake, you know, bases their uh, evaluation based on a single 24 hour, and they don't account for the day to day variation that occurs within person variation that occurs across time. So for that, we applied the anytime method. We did also biochemical tests like ferritin, serum iron, and we also did inflammation markers like CRB to adjust for inflammation. And finally, we did hemoglobin test. What we found is in the high cluster anemia area, in the hotspot, hotspot area of Ethiopia, iron deficiency is the most important cause of anemia. I mean, at least associated with anemia. For instance, inadequate iron consumption among children living there was 50%. Half of the children were having inadequate intake of iron. And iron deficiency was 72%, very high. And iron deficiency anemia was 54%. And anemic children, anemic children were, you know, iron deficient, 92% were iron deficient. In our paper five, we want to see what are the barriers and facilitators to the implementation of nutrition intervention at primary health care unit of Ethiopia using a concept, a consolidated framework for implementation. We did key informant interview with 42 stakeholders and we explored barriers to nutrition intervention, such as relative priority, less priority to nutrition services at primary health care unit. One of our respondents, 24 year old, old female midwife, said, Nutrition service receives little attention. It's not a pressing concern in the health facilities. This is because it's not something for which we are evaluated. For example, in the report, I'm asked how many mothers I serve with NDC rather than how many mothers I counsel for nutrition. The other example was the relative advantage. Some service provider believes that if the mother can afford to eat diversified diet, there is no need to supplement them with iron folic acid supplementation. A surgery old midwife said, if pregnant mothers are consumed a diversified and balanced diet, it might substitute the iron. The only alternative for iron folic acid supplementation is to eat diversified food. In conclusion, there is no progress in the reduction of anemia in Ethiopia. Clustering of anemia is found in the Eastern pastoralist part of Ethiopia. Being young, poor, malnourished, and living with maternal anemic mothers are risk factors for childhood anemia. Iron deficiency is the most important prevalent anemia in the eastern part. 
Barriers include less priority to nutrition service, less staff commitment and motivation, and poor leadership engagement. The implication of our study are policymakers should target anemia hotspot areas. Anemia control strategy should be built into the primary health care system of Ethiopia. Healthcare leaders should consider nutrition as a priority and further research on the impact of food-based interventions and behavioral change, social behavioral change communication on anemia prevention should be conducted. Implementation research to optimize iron folic acid adherence should be also conducted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bilal, for a very clear presentation. We will now start with the opposition. And the opposition will be opened by Professor Tenkate, who was chair of the assessment committee of your thesis, and Professor Tenkate is professor of internal medicine at Masters University Medical Center. Professor Tenkate. Thank you very much, dear candidates. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, to be able to address you on this uh, occasion. And I want to congratulate you with the accomplishment of this uh, beautiful and uh, very important thesis. And it's potentially also very impactful, I think. And given, well, the facts that you also showed us today, uh, there, there still is much reason for improvement uh, of many of these factors that contribute to anemia in the Ethiopian population. Um, so I'm, I also want to extend these congratulations to your promotee team, your promoters, and your co-promoter online, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Um, so having said that, I would like to address chapter five, um, if that's okay. And uh, I have a couple of questions that deal with the causes of anemia and, uh, and a few that deal with the management. Um, you also indicated in the table in your presentation, there are underlying causes at, well, at a level of, of policy, et cetera, that politics that are very hard to change, of course. And there are also immediate determinants that you indicated uh, malnutrition probably being the most important one, but also infectious diseases you uh, indicated. And also in chapter five, you try to uh, rule out the presence of infection in these children. Uh, for instance, malaria, which is an important cause in other population-based uh, studies I've seen. Uh, but that was not an issue here. It's, it's probably not an endemic population or endemic area. Um, but do you think that you have been able to sufficiently rule out uh, infectious diseases by, with helminths, with parasites, intestinal parasites? That's the first question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, highly esteemed opponent. Uh, this is a very nice question. Uh, actually, uh, you know, anemia is multifactorial and it's very difficult to, to rule out every cause of anemia in a single study. So what we have tried is to include some markers of inflammation like C-reactive protein, but we couldn't afford to have AGP, for instance, which is also another uh, marker for inflammation. And also we couldn't measure hepcidine, which can also be a sign of uh, inflammation. And we didn't do also intestinal parasite for the limitation of budget. Uh, but that could also be like hookworm and other infections can also be the cause for uh, anemia. And uh, chronic infections like TB, HIV also can contribute to anemia. In addition to that, hemoglobin disorders, genetic abnormalities can also be responsible uh, did you, if in, I in anemia. Asked, did you rule out any hemoglobin or patien like thalassemia or sickle cell disease? No, we, we couldn't make that in the lab facility we have. What we yeah. actually, it's not very common in our setting, from previous research, it's very rare events. It, it didn't happen most of the time, especially genetic uh, hemoglobinopathy and other diseases are very rare phenomena. And uh, we, we didn't see that, but what I, I could check was malaria. And yeah. uh, it's not very malaria endemic area as an area, but because malaria is one of the most important cause, we did rapid tests and uh, all of the children were negative for malaria. Yeah. So yeah, I think- it, yeah, yeah. So that's unlikely uh, cause. And you, you mentioned indeed AGP uh, as an alternative biomarker would have, have added much to the diagnostic yeah. potential to detect inflammation because I'm, I have insufficient knowledge of Which AG, the AGP uh, yeah. protein. So the, the, the CRP and the AGP are important inflammatory markers. 
because the ferritin level increases uh, during inflammation. So the ferritin may not be a reliable indicator for iron deficiency unless we adjust for CRP. The HEP is good for longer time of infection. If children have longer duration of infection, CRP will detect only uh, acute phase of infection. So AGP, if I add AGP, I can somehow extend the number of days for infection. Yeah. Okay. But we couldn't do the AGP because it's not available. No. Yeah, yeah no. I understand. So now the, the fraction of infected patients was only five. 5.5%, yeah. I think, or so. Yeah. So it may be slightly higher, but not the, mo the most important. Yeah, cost, exactly. Apparently. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I just want uh, to, to continue on, on, well, what to do about the, the problem indeed. Malnutrition seems to be the obvious way uh, to, to, to address and to tackle, but it may also be a difficult one. Um, what about a simple uh, intervention? I was considering the administration of vitamin C tablets, vitamin C. Um, and you also mentioned that in the introduction that ad additional vitamin C might help to increase the uptake of yeah. iron. And it's, it's not very expensive probably. So with limited nutrition, would it be helpful to give extra vitamin C tablets? Or yeah. Yeah. Would that be an option or is that not realistic? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think uh, it, 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 vitamin C is known enhancer for uh, iron absorption and it increased bioavailability of iron. But the issue is, I, I think it will be a good alternative if you can work a lot from that. The area is a bit desert and there is no such fruits and uh, lemon or vitamin rich yeah. food. So unless we do it uh, some other way or we connect it with market or something like that, they cannot easily access that. And uh, the other barrier could be the, you know, behavioral change should be there, you know. People are not aware of uh, the importance of vitamin C and uh, iron deficiency in the community. That's what I understand. So I think it can be tried, but it, it, it's not expensive. It can be tried, but with uh, some sort of visibility initially, how to conduct yeah. it, yeah. 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 Okay, the, the final question, if I may, um, yeah. out of, some curiosity because I don't know the, the, the setting. I've never been there, uh, but but I've read or heard also about people eating soil, uh, like pregnant women, geophagy yeah. <laughs> or pica. Yeah, uh, is that also a habit that may occur in, in these children that they also use soil elements to try to improve iron status and so on, or is that not a common habits. Yeah, it, it is not so far. I, I, I didn't see any report on that. In pregnant mothers, it's quite common. But, yeah, uh, but only but, in pregnant mothers. Yeah, apparently. only in pregnant mothers because of, you know, pregnancy-related uh, iron deficiency physiology. Yeah. But in children... But the children uh, do not have the... I, uh, I, we, may, we may need to investigate that, but uh, <laughs> I didn't know not. that. Yeah. That's a common yeah. thing, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm very satisfied Thank with you. your answers. Give the word back to the proactor. Thank you, Professor Picata. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Krutzen. He's Professor of Behavior Change and Technology at Maastricht University. Thank you very much. Well, uh, dear candidates, uh, my compliments on your thesis. I think you addressed a very important public health topic. And you also did it in the context of Ethiopia. And I read in your uh, biography that you have very strong ambitions to improve your country. So uh, this is uh, definitely a first step towards that. And I also appreciated like the mix of methods that you used, uh, some very advanced statistics, qualitative work, you combine it all. So uh, I think we have we deal with a very skilled researcher here. Um, and I want to start on page 14 of your thesis, uh, where you present the conceptual framework. And uh, you have presented several, what's called it, layers of levels of determinants. And uh, on the highest level was, of course, uh, what you call fundamental determinants. And in that little box, I saw ideology. Yeah. So maybe first, uh, out of curiosity, what do you mean by that? Or what does it mean in, the, in this context, ideology? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a, it's a high, thank you, high, uh, highly esteemed opponent. It's a very nice question. You know, you know uh, the immediate determinants are usually obvious, like nutrition, infection, and so on. But if you ask why, why, why five times, finally, you read to uh, the politics, the governance, and other fundamental causes. So mm -hmm. when we say ideology, the ideology, like political ideology, for instance, 
like <laughs> being like more pro poor you know pro rich you know even uh, liberal somehow conservative these things may indirectly impact the healthcare how the healthcare system is structured is there any you know free for instance medical service for children and uh, is if there is some payments for children to get the service how the food is distributed among children so is there any social uh, you know uh, protection mechanism so it all depends on the ideology the country is built in. So is that human centered or, you know, we can talk a lot about that, but it is like uh, what frames how the country operates? Is it a democratic country or is it highly corrupted or not? So this all depends on the ideology of the country to run that. Okay, and how would you say that is, what is the ideology, so to say then in the Ethiopian context? What is the, in your context, in your study context, what is the ideology there and how does it? So the, the ideology in Ethiopia is uh, in terms of, for instance, uh, you know, it is, it is a country where medical service, for instance, for children is relatively free as the government set up. The primary health care service are, you know, being led by the government. That's a good thing and the free medical service can be obtained in the rural area. But the problem is, because the country is not developed, you know, it cannot deliver quality services for this, uh, even though there are, you know, clinics everywhere for free, but the service they provide, if that's proved by qualitative interview also. So there is no proper counseling, there is no lab equipment, there is no, you know, ant even anthropometric or hemoglobin testing yeah. machine. So even though we can say that, the, 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 you know, the ideology is somehow pro-poor, but because the government is not rich, the country is not rich, I mean, the leadership is not strong, then uh, I don't think that it is well translated into uh, the better health outcome. But for instance, child mortality has reduced significantly and stunting, Ethiopia is one of, by the way, the exemplar countries for the reduction of stunting, stunting globally. Yeah. But when it comes to anemia, you know, there is no change. And I was, that, that's why I started to do this research and Ethiopia has get significant gain in stunting. Some of the factors are the same between stunting and that of anemia, but in anemia, there is no change. I think the global movement in anemia is not even that strong compared to the stunting and the political commitment also for anemia and nutrition related is just a recent movement, especially for anemia. So I can say that the ideology is pro-poor, but uh, because it's not implemented, uh, the leadership at lower level is not yet good, then these are not translated into health gains. Yeah. yeah, okay. So at that level, you say actually it's quite good, and then you go to the lower levels. And then I think that's also a nice bridge to my second question, because in chapter two, you study then these immediate and underlying determinants, and you also just showed it in your presentation. And you use these three waves of data. Um, and maybe the a first question would be, why did you use those three waves? Yeah, yeah. I, I think to see the trend in mm -hmm. anemia, at least 10 years trend, I would like to have that, but we don't have pri previous, I, I would like to see also the 2000, but we don't have hemoglobin data before. Yeah. That. So we at least have the starting from 2005, 2011, 16, this is only data we have at the DHS every five years to be, so yeah. I use all the data in 10 years, I feel that it's okay to see the trend. And uh, yeah, but if you had earlier data, we can also see if there is any trend before that. So yeah, yeah, no, I understand fully. You had to deal with what's, what was available, but I actually meant like, because uh, I can, I understand the trends you want to see in terms of anemia. Yeah. But uh, my interpretation of the study was that the focus was on the determinants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So did you have any expectations in terms of that these determinants also change over time? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, because in 10 years, a lot has been changed for, as I, I told you, stunting has reduced because some of the determinants have been changed. For instance, determinants in terms of wash has been changed mm -hmm. in 10 years and health service coverage has increased and, uh, and other determinants, including food security. So 10 years, we were expecting that some changes in wash, uh, in uh, infection, in uh, other uh, food security issues could have been changed over the 11 years. Yeah, okay, but if you say, for example, um, let's take WASH as an example, so more people uh, practice certain hygiene practices. Yeah. Um, 
then you expect changes in terms of how many people do that, for example, and you hope, of course, that it improves, or do you also expect differences in terms of how that is of predictive value for your outcome? So. so is it like, do you expect that more people, for example, wash their hands, mm -hmm. or do you expect the effect of washing your hands that it differs over time? Both, I think both. both, yeah. The number of, you know, available latrine and water services I expect to increase from time because it was very low some 15 years back. Yeah. You cannot find a latrine in the countryside, for instance, even a single latrine. Yeah. The, so people defecate often and they don't have any water access. But in the past 15 years, there are some improvements, latrine service somehow available in countryside. I, will, I have been there and I have seen some, you know, pits and uh, it's not like a VIP latrine and some water service, yeah. not yet high. So that trend has been changed at the same time because of the health extension workers and uh, community health workers, health, uh, health professionals that are, you know, deployed in the rural area, they start to teach people somehow the relevance. So there could be also some awareness better awareness than it has been before 15 years or 10 years in terms of uh, using uh, water services and uh, hand, uh, hand hygiene and so and so on. So I expect, I was expecting that there could be something. In, stunt, in, in another study on stunting, they try to see this thing, is, its impact on uh, the stunting reduction. Yeah. I have been part of that study and it really matters on the reduction of stunting, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. I have some time left. Okay, then a, a quick final question, um, maybe more methodological, because in your conceptual uh, framework already, you have you see like immediate determinants and underlying determinants. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I would say they also overlap. For example, um, in your analysis, you have uh, I think you have diet as a as an um, immediate determinant, and an underlying determinant is vitamin A, or the other way around. So did you also see in your analysis, like methodologically, did, did you see a lot of overlap of correlates between the determinants that you included in your analysis? Yeah, we have tried to see if there is any correlation between mm -hmm. uh, the exposure variables yeah, among yeah. them. Yeah, but the, there was no such strong uh, correlation and we have checked the VIF and other uh, statistical methodology okay. to determine that, but uh, there was no strong correlations and we put them in the model. Oh, okay, very good. Yeah. That's very reassuring. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. I give the word back to the director. Thank you, Professor Krutze. Uh, the opposition will be now continued by Dr. Mahmoud. Dr. Mahmoud is from Etna Adan University in Somaliland. He's present online by audio unfortunately only because um, uh, he his internet connection is not that good but i hope we can hear dr mahmoud yes thank you very much okay director uh, i'm also pleased to be part of the assessment committee for this very important uh, research work uh, Dear candidate Bilal, Somaliland. Uh, I think you addressed one of the important public health issues, and the analysis was robust application of multiple techniques with representative uh, data coverage. So I would like to congratulate you and congratulate your 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 uh, mentors as well. So uh, I'll go to my uh, views and questions. Uh, just what we learned from your uh, trend analysis on anemia among children is that despite all the interventions that have made, which you have clearly indicated it during your presentation as well as in your book, it seems that there is a lack of success in reducing anemia among children. I hope I am clearly heard. Hello? Hello? Am I clearly heard? Clear yes, yes, no problem. Thank you very much. So across your papers as well, you found associations between uh, child anemia and maternal anemia. And this failurity as well as the association between maternal anemia, this might be also true for other underdeveloped countries. So that is very important because it shows that anemia is deep-rooted, as you have indicated. 
So what would be your comment? Because uh, in addressing the nutritional needs at early stage, for example, improving the nutritional status of adolescent girls in order to break this vicious cycle of anemia. So what would be your comment? Uh, I think this would yeah. be one of the solutions. One of the solutions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, the very esteemed opponent, uh, uh, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, you've read a very good question. So we consistently found that maternal anemia is associated with uh, childhood anemia, uh, especially at young children. Uh, this could be, you know, like any other nutritional problems, there is intergenerational, you know, uh, across generations transmission of like nutritional problems. So if especially pregnant mothers are anemic and if they are not supplemented with adequate amount of iron, obviously in our case, the adherence for iron is less than 10%. So anemic mothers will be anemic. And then that will give birth into lower weight babies, which, which are highly probable to be anemic. Then those anemic children, unless they get adequate amount of iron, especially as a complementary age. The breastfeeding may be okay for the first six months, but it may not be enough after that. So delayed complementary feeding and poor quality complementary feeding is common in our setting. And also infection and other will start as a complementary thing. This will all add up to increase the, 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 the risk of anemia. So, and the child and the mothers are living in similar situation. I mean, if the mother is not getting uh, good quality of diet that can complement her with good amount of iron, the same will apply for children because they are living together. So if, and you know, most of mothers, pregnant mothers in Ethiopia become pregnant very early. Adolescent pregnancy is also very high. So the adolescents also need the time because it's a time of increased growth need more iron and the fetus will need more iron then then that will also increase the risk for iron deficiency so my my, my suggestion here is that you know doing you know a kind of uh, across generational intervention it's not only on children we have to also do our intervention on mothers together and even adolescent girls for instance school in school and out of a school adolescent girls can be given weekly iron folic acid supplementation we have tested that and it's now being scaled up uh, in ethiopia so that could prevent this intergenerational cycle very early not only for iron folic acid supplementation also doing Dietary diversification is also very much important. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, you have said intervention should be way, way before the woman become pregnant for conception. Uh, you are right. So that that would be very important to break the vicious circle. Uh, cycle. Uh, so uh, I will go to my second again opinion on your chapter five, the conclusion that the dietary intake, inadequate intake of dietary iron might be the reason for iron deficiency in children. But what I think is that even high consumption of food items that interfere with the absorption of iron might be more important than for iron deficiencies and inadequate intake of iron. Even from your data, you have shown us that a large amount of children are taking tea in between meals, about 94% uh, percent of them, I think. And there is also uh, food consumption for uh, con that contain high height uh, phytates. So this might be uh, the more important than consuming food items with hem iron. Although this is not a hem iron that you find from this type of food. So wouldn't you suggest that this uh, interference of iron absorption would be more important in that setup with the consumption of food items that infer interfere with iron absorption where there is adequate iron intake? Okay, thank you. I think this is also a very good question. And, uh, you know, one of the determinants of uh, iron deficiency is uh, poor iron bioavailability absorption. That poor iron bioavailability could be because of different reasons. For instance, 
then heme irons like iron found in an animal source of food cannot be easily absorbed. It's just few percent can be absorbed. So in this setting, in pastoralist context, the consumption of animal source of food is almost zero, at least for the study period. Uh, so iron absorption enhancers are very low. Vitamin C is very low. But as you said rightly, the consumption of iron absorption inhibitors, including phytate, and also milk, which contains calcium, is very high. So one of the issue could be bioavailability of iron. And for, for that reason, we uh, said less than 5% bioavailability. We are counted in the analysis of inadequate intake of dietary iron. But uh, bo that's not the only reason, I believe. Even the diet they are getting by itself doesn't have adequate amount of iron because it's totally cereal-based diet with poor bioavailability at the same time, poor iron contact in the district. So I, in, I, I think both poor diet quality and poor absorption can lead to uh, anemia or uh, iron deficiency anemia in that community. Okay, do, do I have here, Pro Richter, do I have my time or? You have two more minutes. So okay. you can ask a small question. Very good, okay. Uh, okay, uh, dear candidate, do you, much of the data were uh, both from DHS as well as from your own uh, study, much of the data was from rural areas. And we know that rural areas are predictors for anemia. Do you think that could have biased the, the total prevalence of anemia in the country? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you. So Ethiopia is more of a rural country, like only 20% is urban, so 80% is rural. And uh, in my study in pastoralist context and the DHS data also is mainly rural reflecting the, the you know, the existing situation. So uh, especially in Somali region, in my study, the rural is a bit, uh, uh, you know, overrepresented because uh, uh, in the district that I was working, urban area doesn't contribute much. So the sampling is based on proportional to the population size. So uh, it, I don't think that it will much affect the, uh, you know, the overall finding. It may affect a little bit, but because the, poop, the rural population dominates overall and in the same district, then I don't think that it will create that much problem in terms of representation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Let me take you much. back to the yeah. prorector. Thank you. I'm satisfied. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Aardgeert. He's professor of general practice at the University of Leuven in Belgium. Welcome, Professor Aardgeerts. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, dear Bilal, this is an except, exceptional work and perhaps a little bit inappropriate to say so, but it reads like a novel, well-structured, uh, balanced and with a clear goal reached at the end. Um, and it gives a tour of insight of one of the biggest problems in our world, uh, besides wars and so on, um, because it hampers a uh, population from achieving a healthy life. So my first question will be, given the food shortage and an upcoming disaster such as a famine in Somalia, how should you encourage universities and governments to co-create solutions for this complex problem? And which departments, groups are the most useful to cooperate with? Uh, thank you, highly esteemed opponent. This is a very nice question. Uh, you know, I was very much wondering on um, how to solve this problem in Ethiopian context and uh, the universities, uh, you know, are located in every district, by the way, in every zones, we have like in every region universities, which are very close to the districts they are living. So what I recommend is this universities should be, you know, a focal point to study the problem of their community and beyond 
and to work together in collaboration with the regional health bureau, the government, and other sectors like education, uh, agriculture sector, uh, trade sector, which are very much related with nutrition. So nutrition is a multi-sectoral problem. It's not only for the health sector. So what connects this whole thing is academics. You know, the academics, if they work together with all these sectors, I think, for instance, the etiology of anemia can be somehow clear. It's, it's, still, it's not clear. I have somehow contributed, but it's not yet over. So the universities, if they work with the program leaders and uh, governments, if they work synergistically, so the wash problem is important determinants. They can solve it. Poverty is another important problem. Uh, vitamin C and the fruit and vegetables. So the trade, the road integration between you know different societies are very much important. So the inferences are you know a very they are in a very strategic position to connect these sectors and come up with like implementation research on how to solve for instance, iron folic acid supplementation problem, adherence problem among pregnant, the wash problem, the behavioral problem uh, in the community, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you for your answer, but I, going back to Belgium, Leuven, also uh, a university, how can I convince my university to work or to collaborate with you and other universities around the world to solve this problem? Yeah. What, can, what can I do yeah. as your opponent yeah. now okay. within my university? Yeah. So how can we, pardon please, how can we? How can I spread the message that this is an important topic and that we have to collaborate with you or other colleagues to solve the problem? Of anemia. Yeah, okay. of course. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, <laughs> last week, fortunately, the World Health Organization arranged a seminar on anemia and they invited me to be part of that. So it was a global alliance for anemia reduction. And now I think the world is very much conscious that it's not doing well in the anemia reduction. So such platform, using such platforms with evidence and uh, showing collaboration is always, especially the COVID area, I think give us a lot of lessons that unless we do together as a globe and as different sectors coming together, problems cannot be solved. You know, diseases don't have borders. So this thing should be with evidence and bringing some change and showing them back for the officials or for the university leaders could be one you know, uh, way to convince uh, those leaders. Yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you. Because this bridges uh, the, um, my other question. How should you, um, in, uh, well, uh, implement this way of working, what you did with your work in other countries, and what will be the budget that uh, you're asking for? Because uh, I understood that your budget was just some peanuts from Geert Jan. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, which budget is, um, is allowed to, to investigate this in other countries? In Africa, so which budget do you need for researcher uh, um, issues in uh, well to to do this? Yeah, for my research or in general. In general. Okay, in general, I think <laughs> we need to uh, first map the resources. You know, mapping the resources available. There are different partners globally, uh, including uh, different international. Uh, philanthropic organization who are very much interested with uh, funding such a kind of huge problem. Yeah, standing has been reduced because of that effort. I know different uh, partners, including non-governmental organizations, government are come together through advocacy and uh, lobbying and showing the problem. And I think, you know, if we work like with partners working on anemia, especially, so they can support universities from the north and south, collaboration between these universities in the North and South. So uh, I can name uh, some of the organization, but I think uh, we know that there are a lot of organizations that we need to uh, go and show them that this is a huge problem. And if they invest on this problem, the return is very high. And it is a, a very cost-effective intervention because for instance, iron deficiency, it's not only a health problem. It's really, you know, delays the cognitive development of children that will delay 
the school, you know, decrease the capacity of school performance, learning. So that will, it is like a huge problem. So not only the health sector, but the education sector and other development sector. So putting anime as a developmental agenda is an important issue, I think. Yeah. But I'm asking this because there's now on our country a big debate about giving a lot of money to our army. So to fight against Russian and so on mm -hmm. and so on. This, this will be a choice we have to make between uh, investigating in your research. Mm -hmm. So what is your budget? Can you, have you an amount of dollars or euros yeah. what you need to, to further in this investigate? And I guess it's not the same budget as uh, our army will ask. Yeah. I think, uh... You know, the budget will not be too much, I mean, uh, for doing uh, such a kind of innovative uh, research uh, in local context, especially if you work in Ethiopia, you know, it's not very expensive. <laughs> How expensive? <laughs> <laughs> for instance, I did uh, the fifth paper on iron deficiency anemia with uh, like, uh, I mean, like, in Ethiopia, it's like half a million, uh, 500,000 bur. But in, in our context, it's like in, in dollar, when you convert in dollar, it is less than uh, $30,000 or something. Yeah, $25,000. Okay, but that's, that's if really you want to make it national level, then it, it may quite need hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure from where we can get it, but I think uh, it should be a priority. I know war is also the case in our condition. A lot of conflicts are there. It's a, it's a choice that we have to make as a as a society. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. I have just one little question? Okay. Um, so you said that starting a PhD could be a choice. Finishing the journey requires high level of motivation, discipline, focus, and flexibility. Yeah. So I'm wondering, did nobody tell you? beforehand yeah what pardon yeah. i'm sorry so this uh making a phd yeah. is really a, a tough yeah. journey yeah. yeah yeah but did nobody said it to you beforehand before starting your phd yeah <laughs> yeah i i think when i started my phd i was like very much excited and uh, you know I was a medical student before and I did my master's and I enjoyed learning. But what makes very much different from my expectation in my PhD journey is that then there was a big problem in budget, for instance. After I started the PhD, I didn't get any budget to conduct because the scholarship was not there. So, okay, I should have to wait like for one year having the proposal. So should I quit or continue? then the flexibility comes then, no, okay, with the data I have, then I have to start. Then for that, I need some motivation. Then after I start the, the analysis, and again comes, oh, I do secondary data analysis, I have to do some primary going to the rural area by myself. So for that, again, I need some budget. So some sort of flexibility. And because the country, uh, Ethiopia was unstable at that time, you, you can imagine, it needs some sort of focus. Otherwise you will be, you know, you will stop or you'll be diverted. A lot of chaos was happening in the country. So sometimes I go out, but I still need to focus and flexibility. And it needs also discipline because I'm working from remote. My advisors are here, I'm there. So we need to, you know, always meet and do it. So that needs quite a discipline. I know that, but when I really experience that, uh, it is quite a different experience, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for this answer. I'll thank you very much, Professor Aertgert. Uh, then we go to the last opponent, Professor De Vries. Professor De Vries is Professor of Health Promotion at Maastricht University. Yes, thank you. Well, this might be a bit repetitive, but uh, I would also like to congratulate you on this work. I think it's very important. It's a clear problem description uh, of, a, of an important health problem, I think, uh, not only in your country, but all over the world. Um, in Africa especially, of course, I think uh, all across Africa, there's about 60% anemia in population, which is also the figure that you find. 
Now, I'm a professor in health promotion, and we in health promotion like uh, multi-level uh, theories or, you know, and that's why I was also impressed by your, uh, by your analytical framework, conceptual framework on page 14. Many people here already talked about intervention possibilities, etc., cetera, which, uh, uh, which of, of course are connected to this uh, framework. And I'm also an interventionist, so uh, I'll, I'll go on in this uh, direction. Um, and let, let me start very openly. Uh, at which level would you preferably like to intervene using this framework? Because generally, I'd say that the higher up, the more widespread the effects of your intervention, the lower down, the more directed, but maybe with, uh, with higher uh, results in terms of, uh, of fighting anemia. So what would be your idea? Yeah. Uh, thank you, highly esteemed professor. I think uh, if we want an immediate response, which we want, of course, an immediate you know, uh, gain, we need to work on the lower part, like supplementation and uh, like treatment of infection and the like. Mm -hmm. But we need to parallelly also do the higher up, like food security issue. Unless we do that, the higher up level, even though it's complex, difficult, then we'll not solve the problem. It's a very reasonable answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, but I was thinking about this, and then, uh, you know, you, you described many, many factors that, uh, that are related to the prevalence of uh, anemia. Uh, but when I look at them, the reduction that you might, uh, might um, uh, produce is always very limited. So, for instance, I saw that uh, suppletion, suppletion of iron-rich foods or taking iron-rich foods only reduces anemia by 10%. It's on page four, uh, 34 in your thesis. Uh, wealth, which is a very important factor, but the difference between the poorest and the richest is about 17%. Um, now, so if we combine all those factors, there might be a considerable reduction in anemia, but my question would still be, and I did not find that figure, if you combine all factors, what would be the reduction in anemia that you could find? So this is, of course, epidemiological, so it's it's just uh, descriptive, uh, yeah. but still, if you combine everything, how much would be the reduction in anemia? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I don't have a straight answer for this question uh, in terms of, you know, uh, suggesting exactly the figure, but because anemia is a multifactorial and multi-level cause, so there is no single intervention which can, you know, uh, reverse the problem. In some setting, iron deficiency anemia is very important. For instance, in my setting in pastoralist context, if iron deficiency is the most important cause, so supplement 50%, globally 50, 50% of anemia mm -hmm. is caused by iron deficiency. So iron deficiency in a highly iron deficient area could solve the problem at least by half in areas where iron deficiency anemia is very high. Yeah, yeah, but then the uptake of iron should be very high as well. Very high. So, so there are many, many factors intervening again, even if you if you supply iron or if you if you have certain foodstuffs that that might you know uh, be more available to people, yeah. then still there's uh, lots to be. Yeah. So you know that's why the intervention should not be a single intervention. No. So the intervention should be as complex as the etiology. Yeah. So the wash services, the education, okay. everything should come together. So it's like a development. Issue. I have a magic bullet. What? I have a magic bullet. Oh. It's called education. Education, okay. <laughs> because education says something about knowledge about nutrition, which is one of the factors yeah. that you that you mentioned. It says something about, uh, well, let's say development, not only for anemia, but for all kinds of issues. Of course, it might help. It might even help in economical terms because the country could develop. And I think WHO also, um, well, stresses education as sort of a not immediate but distant factor that might, and of course, longer term because education does not result immediately in all kinds of effects, but would this be, um, well, a suggestion that you might consider? Sure, sure, yeah, sure. Education is like, uh, not only for anemia, actually, 
for most of the health problems, uh, especially women education, girls education, because they become a mother, then it will be a most important determinant and uh, educating girls and all the society is an important instrument, but it's a long term, as you said. But in addition to the long term education, nutrition education and some uh, behavioral change education can also, you know, in addition to the school, the formal education may also uh, contribute. But in some food insecure area, education should be supplemented with some, you know, education plus yeah. Yeah. some sort of food or something should be also available. For so that, you rely heavily on, uh, on uh, iron folic acid. Yeah. Uh, which is given to mothers uh, and and preferably of course way before they they get pregnant yeah. um, but i also saw that uh, the effect um, in terms of reduction for the children is very very limited mm -hmm. and that is of course because after six months mm -hmm. the uh, the storage of iron that is uh, given by the mother to the child has disappeared so so i was wondering would it not be better to 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 find a scheme to do some iron suppletion. To find? To, uh, some way of doing iron suppletion, so um, maybe medicinal iron to the children themselves. Yeah, I, I think that is one of screening, uh, anemia screening for children and iron supplementation or fortification is one strategy for reduction of anemia in children. Yeah. Yeah, that is one strategy, but it's not, being practiced in Ethiopia. It is a global recommendation also, iron supplementation yeah. in children, but yeah. uh, now it's being included in the guideline and it will be started, yeah. I think, hopefully soon. Yeah. Okay. I still have another question, if you allow me, um, which is about the 2011 data, because I see that in the, um, in the prevalence, there's a dip. Mm -hmm. Uh, you showed that 2005 is the same as 2016, but 2011 is considerably lower. Yeah. Do you have any explanation? Yeah, that was, uh, you know, somehow unexpected uh, because 2005, 2016, they are comparable. But... You can uh, give the answer later. Oh. Okay. Because this is the end uh, of the session. Thank you, Professor De Vries. Um, the opportunity for defending your thesis has passed and the degree committee will now retire to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. And I ask you to await our, uh, the outcome of our deliberations and our return here in this room.
Mr. Bilal Shikur Andris, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Specht, Dr. Specht, is so authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor now to take the floor. Bilal, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I do promise. Then, by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee, committee here present, I hereby confer you upon you, Bilal Shikur Endres, the degree of doctor and grant you all the rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Bilal, congratulations with your PhD, also on behalf of Professor Gertjan and Dr. Sefi. And hopefully many of your friends and family are viewing this live stream, so also to them I would like to say congratulations. You did a wonderful job today. You really showed you mastered the topic. You are now an expert in childhood anemia with a PhD. And I wrote this down yesterday, so you see, I have a lot of faith in you. Our journey started together with a coffee. Do you remember? I even have some pictures of that moment. We were having a coffee in Addis Ababa together with Solomon. And my wife, Maud, was also there. Solomon introduced us to each other, stating that this is a very clever guy and that I should certainly should consider you as a PhD student. We had a good coffee and a good talk and I also liked your topic very much, so we decided to go for it. The past four years, our collaboration was very smooth, I would say. Basically, you went from one study to the other without really big problems. You came to Maastricht two times to meet and work with Gertjan and me, but also due to, due to COVID, our relationship was mostly online, uh, an online uh, relationship, discussing the progress of the studies and the papers. Nevertheless, I do feel that we really built a very good appreciation for each other. The first time you came to Maastricht, it was winter. Must be four years ago. You were lucky then because there was snow. Together with my family, we went sleighing in Belgium. You really enjoyed the snow. And my family especially had to laugh when you laid down in the snow to pose for the pictures. Unfortunately, you had to return home much sooner uh, that time than expected because there were big problems with your brother. Your studies were about childhood anemia, as you have shown today. You covered almost all major factors that contribute to the enormous problem of anemia in Ethiopia. You wrote the first paper in your thesis together with a student from Maastricht University, Helen Hendricks. Helen stayed a few months in Addis together with some other students. Helen did, it, did a very thorough analysis of the DHS data. Together with Tariku, was it? Yeah. The statistician, the three of you developed a nice model to see the influencing factors uh, for childhood anemia. Chapter three and four were the really advanced papers with geospatial and Bayesian statistics. Here we really needed the help of Dr. Safi. Although he is a very nice guy, he is also an expert in very complicated statistics. 
Seifu also joined you on your second visit to Maastricht. There are a very few very good memories that I have from this visit. The first one is buying glasses in Eisner. You and Seifu negotiated with the eye specialist. Much tougher than I would do, but with success, you got the glasses almost half the price. We also had a very nice coffee afterwards to celebrate the buying of the glasses. We had a very funny and interesting discussion on how to handle arguments with our wives. The final two papers of your thesis also went rather smooth. You had really strong ideas about observational study. Right from the beginning of your PhD, you had ideas about the different causes of anemia in different settings. You really did not believe that dietary intake of iron was not an important problem. In chapter five, you clearly showed that iron deficiency is the major factor in your population, making dietary intervention very important. But also this study went very smooth from my point of view. It must have been uh, hard for you sometimes, but you seem to do it with ease. The fact that dietary intervention is so important led to the final chapter where you explored how we could improve healthcare services to reduce the dietary problems related to anemia. You are very dedicated. You must be stressed sometimes, but you appear to stay calm and focused. To finish your thesis, you locked yourself up for a few weeks in a hotel outside the city. The progress that you made during this retreat was crucial for finishing on time. Your dedication and talent is also noticed by others. Recently, you received the Emerging, Emerging Faculty Scholar Award at Addis Ababa University. And very recently, there was a whole documentary about you on national television. Even Maastricht University was shown in that documentary. So now you are also one of our ambassadors in Ethiopia. They stated that you are an example for the children in Ethiopia. What more could you want? Tomorrow, we will discuss how we will continue our collaboration. You are now ready to make the next steps in your career. I'm very sure you will succeed, and I look forward to these next steps in our collaboration. Bilal, I wish you all the best with your PhD. Thanks a lot for the wonderful collaboration thus far. Good luck with your career. Take care of your family and try to enjoy life as much as possible. Dear Dr. Bilal, also on behalf of the Board of Deans of Maastricht University, I would like to congratulate you with the honor you have acquired. And I'd also like to congratulate your family, friends, and colleagues in Ethiopia and maybe all over the world. Um, I can tell you that the committee uh, here present was very impressed by the way you defended your thesis, um, enthusiastic even passionate, and uh, you both showed knowledge about details, but also were able to have a great overview of the uh, wider implications of the field you work in. So that's a very, very good uh, uh, property of a scientist. So I wish you all success with your future career, and I understand you will keep on the collaboration with Maastricht University, if it if that's possible. So uh, I hope you enjoy your time here in Maastricht and your return to Ethiopia. Uh, it's good that you could be here. Uh, your other uh, uh, people from uh, Ethiopia have to be present online. So you're really a special case that you could be here. Um, I'd also like to thank all the members of the degree committee here present and present online. Thank you very much for uh, giving your time to this uh, important uh, ceremony. And um, I also congratulate your supervising team and the supervisor that is online with this uh, achievement. So with this, I close this ceremony. And uh, with that, um, I'd like um, to ask the people that are online maybe to congratulate you because we can do it afterwards. The recording is last.
Professor Mahmoud. Ja, 